भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय ओ नमो भगवते वासुदेवाय Live from Super Soul Farm, it is Wisdom of the Sages, your daily yoga podcast with your host Raghunath and co-host and bestie and senior educator at the Bhakti Center, Kostuba Das. Welcome to the show. Today is a very special day. It is usually on Thursday, but today, because yesterday was a big celebration for Lord Ram, we had special Ram Kata, where we speak about Ram the entire show. Usually we study just the ancient Srimad Bhagavatam. We're, we are moving our way through that book, 18,000 verses. I think we're on verse six. Just kidding. We're on Canto one. But today, once a week, because this stuff brings up important questions. And so once a week, we dedicate to question day. Usually Thursday. Today, it's Friday. If you have questions and you want to be on question day and get your, get your question read, and you can write if you want it anonymous or not, then you write Mara, our uh, executive producer, at Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. That's Wisdom of the Sages 108 at gmail.com. And if you'd like to join us live on Zoom, you can do it. We got about 95 people today, this morning. And um, you just also have to write Mara at the same address and she will hook it up. And you can join us at 5 a.m. Eastern Time. So generally, we've got a lot of people from the East Coast, from Europe, some from South Africa, some from India, um, some from Canadians. Occasionally, we get a Californian in. The Californians are always peering in, but they're either up really late or have some crazy schedule. Um, so we welcome everybody. Otherwise, you can listen to us on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. And if you like us there, it really makes a difference. If it's, if it's a, give us a five-star review because we get a chance to be in the public vision of our rankings. And so many people have ranked us high that it's, it's actually unbelievable. You open up your iPhone and you can go to religion and spirituality. And we're, we've been ranking on so many weeks, high ranks. Uh, sometimes we've been number one for a few times. And then different countries have their own rankings. So it makes a big difference and, uh, for us because- but where are we big right now? You know, I haven't checked in a while. I'm sort okay. of like lazy with checking our, but we were big like in peculiar places sometimes too. <laughs> like uh, Austria, we were big in Austria for a while and uh, big in- Japan. Yeah. Did you, che- did you, have you checked? Not in a long time, but I remember we were like number three in Japan at some point for number for three in Japan. And spirituality. You know, for those J- Japanese who are dying for some good Krishna kata, there we're here for you. <laughs> but um, anyway, it's good and, and and it's important for people to hear the Bhagavatam. That's not just me saying that, but it is me saying that. But it's the Bhagavatam itself saying that. It can redirect the lives and the minds and the hearts of a misguided civilization. This is the Bhagavatam speaking. And so um, anyway, today's a good day, question day. Um, right. Want to dive well, right uh, in, Prabhu? Yeah, I want to mention one more thing. You mentioned that uh, people could send questions in to uh, wisdom of the sages 108 at gmail.com. And there's another channel too. If you are a Patreon member and if you are on our Discord channel that is open to Patreon members, then there's also the questions and answers uh, channel on that chat board or thing. And that's also a good place. So those two places are the best place to, places to leave questions. We often get questions coming through other channels and uh, our only fear is that they get lost because there's so many channels and there's so there's many Too many questions. channels. Yeah. So, yeah. Don't write us on Instagram or on Facebook. Just write us on one of those two channels. Um, and yeah, and th- and wanna th- I want to thank the Patreon people that are really supporting us doing the show. It means a lot to us. Um, it's patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And due to this quarantine, I've been getting to do a lot of Krishna Leela uh, in the evening. So I've been trying to do it a few days a week. Um, and you know, so my that, wife and I were saying last night after, after we, we said, you know, we got to get to the point where we got someone going every night and we could even pull in other people, you know? You know, it's good. It's good to have evening wind down. Yeah. You know what I mean? That way you got your morning and your evening set. 
and you're covered and you're covered. And um, I like the idea of going through the, the, yesterday was fun for me. I think I had a breakthrough yesterday because I just told the stories of Ram Leela and I've been reading Krishna book. So I am thinking of just cramp your style a little bit. Is that what you're saying? Not cramping my style. And I don't want, and it's not like a diss on the Krishna book. I love the Krishna book, but like my, you know, everybody's got like something they're good at. (laughs) Some people are good at very many things. I just like to tell stories. So I think I'm a, I'm a little confined when I'm reading the story right. and I feel a little bit more free when I just tell you the story. Flow. So if it's okay with everybody who's listening to the uh, Patreon account, I think I might just tell the stories instead of reading from the Krishna book. If that's okay with everybody, if it's not okay with anybody, you can let me know on our chat board. Our Zoomers have a chat board. So I will do less of a reading and more of just telling the story if that's okay. But you're going to read it three times before you mentioned, right? But I'll read it the whole stuff. Yeah, so I don't just make up parts like I usually do. <laughs> <laughs> okay, you ready? I'm ready. Okay, um, so our first question today comes from Finland, our friend and regular Zoomer, Krishangi. Oh, Krishangi, we love you, Krishangi. Okay, Krishangi so- and her husband, they, they make these incredible Krishna comic books. Have you ever seen one of them? I would love to see them. I haven't seen them yet. Okay, Krishangi, you got to send one. Similar to Kostuba. And, and um, her husband's name, which again is Ka- Kamalaksha. Kamalaksha. And uh, the weird thing was we did, we did, when, when was that? I, I've known Krishangi for years. She's from Finland. Um, but um, we were having Kirtan in Cologne outside the German yoga conference. And so a bunch of the Swiss people from the show, like, uh, I think Vivi and Nikki, Nick, Nika and um, Nicole and uh, Hendrik, a bunch of us came together. Uh, Bhakta Andy, perhaps. We we have a kirtan. We walked down to the giant church, the Cologne, the dome in Cologne, in the main center of the city. And we just started having kirtan, and out of nowhere, Krishangi just shows up. <laughs> Isn't that peculiar? She's not even from Germany. She was just going on her way. She was working in Cologne and saw us ch- chanting there. And so that was, I haven't seen her in many, many years. So there was some incredibly peculiar, weird, divine arrangement. And now she's on the show regularly. Great. Okay. Well, right, here's, question? here's Krishangi's question. She says, I've noticed that it's usually easy for people to understand the idea that the cell of the self being separate from the gross material body as that's somewhat similar to the Christian idea of body and soul. But the concept of the subtle material body, the mind and intelligence also being different from the self seems to be hard for a lot of people to grasp. Or maybe I'm just doing a really bad job of explaining it. (laughs) So how would you try to convince a person that they're neither their body nor their mind? Okay. So that's a very good question and really important too, because I think that the, the, basically we live in our minds and we identify with the mind in a very strong way. Even as, as she's saying, what happened? Are you, are you, are you chair fall apart? I, I, got, I hit the wrong button and I sunk. Okay. So um, uh, we live in our mind, we identify with the mind. And even if we were kind of getting it that the body is just a vehicle, we think that the mind is us that's Mm. us that's using the vehicle but really the mind is just the next layer it's and and i'm going to give two ways that this subject can be approached the first one is by an exercise and that is uh if someone even does some very beginning exercises in meditation they can get the clear realization that because because often meditation will begin with sitting very still bringing your mind to your breath so that you start to slow down and enter into a state where you can be a little bit more contemplative. You know, we got to slow down and think about these things, right? People just running off their hunches or their biases. You got to slow down and become a little bit thoughtful. And then generally, you know, a yoga uh, meditation teacher may say, now watch your own thoughts. Watch the thoughts come, watch the thoughts go. And, and, And what happens is you begin to realize, I am looking at my mind. These are two different entities. There's me and there's my mind. And that mind is actually out of control. I actually have very little control of that mind. It is separate and has a life of its own. 
So the, the meditation teacher might say, you know, just watch those thoughts. Don't try to change them. Just watch them come, watch them go. And you get that experience. And if we think about it, we'll find that I enter into all kinds of mental states that I would prefer not to be in. Sometimes I'm depressed. Sometimes I'm, you know, um, frustrated. Sometimes I'm angry when I don't want to be, but my mind is in that condition and I am experiencing the mind, right? There's, there's the mind that's out there that's going through its changes. And then there's me that is experiencing the changes of the mind. So if one thinks about that deeply, then one may get the idea, oh, I get it. That thing has a life of its own. It's not me. And I'm kind of a victim to it very much of the time. So that's one thing. Try, try to watch your mind and, and understand that I am watching the mind. The two are separate. That's a good one. Okay. But, but I find this, so that's something that people have been doing for centuries, practicing that. But now to bring into more modern context, um, there's a very powerful, deep, strong analogy that one can use to understand the mind. And that is that the mind is nothing but a very subtle and sophisticated computer, right? The mind is a computer. The eyes are the camera. The ears are the microphone. The voice is the speaker, et cetera, et cetera. It's, it's, if you go deep into this analogy, you'll find that it holds up and it's very, very strong. So if we think about it that way, what, what, what's happening in life is that within this body, there's the soul, the conscious being, and the soul has a mind that is connected to input devices called the senses. The senses are bringing in, the eyes are bringing in visual data that's being downloaded to the hard drive of the mind. The ears are bringing in audio data that's being downloaded to the hard drive of the mind. The mind is accepting this data, processing the data, and storing the data just as a computer does. And then the user of the computer can draw upon that data and then use those same channels, use the speaker to communicate, use the screen to communicate in different ways we, we use. We can take in information, store it, process it, and send it out. But what, what happens is through that programming, through the, through the programming that comes in, through the data that's downloaded, or practically we could say hacked into our computer by our experience, our sensual experience as we move through the world, there is programming that becomes... Uh, downloaded on that mind to convince us of different things. This is good. This is bad. This will make you happy. This won't. This is who you are. All these different conceptions are downloaded there. All that information can be changed. It can be, it can be updated. It can be erased and replaced with something else. That is what the mind is. It's nothing but a computer. And the soul is the user of the computer. And if you think about that or speak on that level, then that might also help people understand that the mind is just a tool. It's just a machine, a very subtle machine, a very tricky machine, you know, uh, to get a grip on, but a machine nonetheless. So, Good answer. Good answer, Prabhu. Thank you. Prabhu. Maybe, maybe you should read my question. I should read your question. <laughs> oh, okay. I'll read, I'll read the question to you. You're you know what I mean? And then I'll read your question. Okay. Sort of, Good. It's almost Good. like I'm questioning it. Okay, great. So this is coming via email. We don't have a name on this one. You ready? Ready. I'm 21 years old. I started listening to the podcast after Rogan's appearance on Joe Rogan's podcast. That made a big impact on me. Since then, I have listened to every single episode to date via Apple Podcasts. All right. Over the last three years, I have suffered. Rogan, Rogan. Joe Rogan gets some highest credit. Joe Rogan. <laughs> Over the last three years, I have suffered from pretty severe anxiety and depression. Listening has healed me in many ways I did not think were possible. That's wonderful to hear. I have, an, I have a lot of love inside me, and Bhakti resonates strongly with me. I'm a very sensitive person, so much so that mistakes that I have made in the past and even the pain of my loved ones causes my heart to ache. Mm. For years, I thought that I was just weak, and I was making up the pain in my mind. But I am coming to realize that it is very much a real deep pain in my soul. My question is, why do I feel this way? 
why can I not let go of my past mistakes and the sufferings of others? Is there anything in the teachings of bhakti that can help me let go of this pain? Good question. Yeah. You know, um, first of all, I think that anybody who doesn't have a little bit of anxiety, I really could, I really think they're lost. If you don't have a little bit of anxiety in this world, you're not like looking at the world like deeply enough. You're just like, woohoo, going through life. You know, we live in a, a very, very critical time and you might be in a bubble where everything's safe and everything's strong, but it's the first time this coronavirus has like brought everybody to their knees and made it eat the first world realize like, oh, I get it. Everything can be dismantled in a moment. And the Bhagavatam speaks about this on a regular basis. Um, and it, it, it guides you on how to take shelter in times of uh, great reversals, great anxiety, great depression. Great, It guides us in that regard. But I think it's normal to have a little bit of anxiety, and I think it's healthy too. It's when that we let it sort of like cripple us and when we let depression cripple us because then it's not just affecting me, it's affecting everybody I love. So it's good that you write questions like that because it's um, – important to address it and um was depression one of them Kostub, or was it just depression anxiety? and anxiety both and and empathy for others that's so deep that it causes them suffering empathy for others that it causes suffering for others no suffering for themselves and others i feel so much in others pain that it's almost too much for me to bear i think is oh. what was being expressed well first of all you're doing a good thing reading the bhagavatam every day will assist us in our healing um, for, 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 for simple versions of depression, you can just start to change your gunas. Like you can personally take responsibility for your gunas. Your gunas are these three forces of nature that dominate us, goodness, passion, and ignorance, just to get us out of passion and ignorance by doing sattvic things. Here they are. One, reading sacred literature. We're doing that right now. So immersing yourself in wisdom literature. Cutting off your relationship with the television as far as really mundane media, really degrading media, um, uh, you know, violent media, stuff like that. Everything in, and I'm putting in should be uplifting and bring me higher. Your diet affects your moods as well. So the things that you put in your mouth, natural foods, vegetarian or vegan foods, um, fre but not just like, you know, I ate soy burgers all, all week. I'm talking about fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, um, salads, um, locally grown things, w doing things that require you to work in nature like garden. Everybody should have a little garden. It's just it, it, your relationship with plants will change your gunas. It's the time of day that you wake up in the morning changes your gunas. If you stay up late, it's going to have an ill effect. After a certain, uh, like it's eight o'clock or something, the, the tamas starts to drag us in and then we become helpless and we become dominated by the gunas. So we can deal, um, and also keeping just a tally of why you're grateful for the things that you have in your life on a regular basis. It's one of our six pillars. You write it on your iPhone, write it on your, on your um, notes, why I am fortunate in my life. Because the tendency is I go right to why I have been cheated in life, why things aren't working out for me in my life. Keep a tally of why you are blessed. And then when you can't think of any more, write five more. And if you have to read it every day, read it every day and add a few more every day. And you might just like take these baby steps to start walking again until you start to make this your um, second nature, like, yeah, I am, I am grateful. I am fortunate. I am blessed. These like little adjustments can help with depression. Um, and will help also with, with the anxiety. Um, and I think these are basic things before people even get on medication that they, they should just do regularly. Uh, um, Let's see, I have a lot of love inside me. Uh, yeah, and um, I'm very sensitive. So much of that makes mistakes in the past, the pains of loved ones. 
my heart starts. Did I, did I miss something, Asuba? No, I think, well, that empathy that they have, but I think what you, I, I just noted down what you just said. It was a nice little checklist. All right. I'm nice going to go through it real quick. Yeah. You said okay. read Bhagavatam and uplifting spiritual content. Cut off a relationship with degrading media. Uh, eat a diet of natural, I would say pranic food, right? Food with good life in it. Yeah. Um, spend time with nature. Early to bed, early to rise, basically. It really makes a difference, especially some people stay up all night. Yeah. Yeah. And that tamasic time, you're going to be prone to depression, right? Especially if this guy's 21. When I was 21, you know, I worked in a nightclub. I like lived, you know, lived at night. Right. And it affects your whole consciousness. For sure. And then finally, you said, keep a tally of why I'm blessed. And so that's just a way of positive thinking, right? So you said that all those things can help with anxiety and depression. I, I think that's a great list. And I think what this person's saying about um, feeling empathy for others, I think if you focus on what Raghunath just said there, that that sympathy or empathy that you have for others will transform into in a way that it's not crippling you, but in a way where it's, it's um, uh, making, you know, allowing that to, to, to be a great instrument of, 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 of uh, empathy in the world, you know? So I think if you bounce that out, it'll become an asset rather than a problem. That, that's a great way to put it. We want to be empathetic. That's, our, that's a good quality. It we don't said want... that the bhakti yogi is what par dukkha dukhi, that they feel the pain of others. They feel the suffering of others. They right. don't have their own suffering, but they, their, their suffering is to feel the sufferings of others. What we don't want is we don't want to feel happy when someone's in pain and we don't want to feel <laughs> sad when, right? We don't want to feel sad when someone's uh, rejoicing right. like, Oh crap. Why don't they get all the breaks? That's so unfair. Yeah. Okay. So, that, uh, all right. I'll read, that, I'll read yours. But the thing is actually, I think this one I need to read myself because I, it was, it's a list of like a bunch of questions all tied together and I kind of arranged it in a particular way to be able to okay. answer this. So this, this is a series of questions coming from Adam Lee. And, and they've been on, on, our, on our backlog for a few weeks now. So I wanted to get to these. Um, so I put them in a different order. One of them I didn't quite understand, so I just took it out. But, uh, and I want to say going into this, that these are things that people sit down and talk for you know, weeks or even years about. So these are some deep questions I'm going to try to handle pretty quickly. But the first one that I want to take is he says... Um, for Adam Lee says, I'm enjoying the podcast, but I have more questions. They said that acceptance of karma and movements towards nature and pure love leads to freedom and betterment in life. Okay. And then he has these questions. First one I want to address. Isn't any talk of happiness through spirituality merely a construct to remain a good slave in this life while the rich live it up at your expense? <laughs> Isn't this just a means to keep the poor placid and docile and content in their class in life for sake of maintaining the unjust social class order in society? Okay, so my answer is I totally would disagree with that position. Um, I get it. I mean, and I believe, you know, that's, it sounds like that question is very informed by like Karl Marx's famous statement that religion is the opiate of the masses. Um, I get the logic to that, but when I, uh, when I, rather than just run on a hunch that that might be the case, I really investigate, um, for instance, and I'm just going to speak from one, one spiritual tradition. And that's the one that we're practicing. Like, let's call it the Vedic tradition. You know, the, 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 the spiritual tradition that grows out of Vyasadeva's literature, the Vedas, the Upanishads, the Mahabharata, uh, the, the, the Puranas, including the Srimad Bhagavatam, you, you go ahead and add to that the Ramayana. Um, you look at this tradition. Um, read these books. Uh, read the commentaries on these books. Experience the, the consistent and sophisticated presentation of philosophy that's there. It's very deep. It's very rich. You can spend a lifetime with it, not get to the bottom of it. You know, see the very consistent and sophisticated theology that's presented there. Uh, and then see all the, 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 the other kind of um, arts and sciences, you know, dealing with yoga, dealing with health like Ayurveda, 
dealing with architecture like Vastu, the teachings that come out of this tradition about government, about social science, about psychology, about cosmology. It, it is such an incredibly rich spiritual tradition that I cannot for the life of me accept that this was just someone's way of trying to control the, the people and keep them docile. You know, and, and in my practice of it, my personal experience of how it's transformative, right? How the deeper you go into it, the more that it makes sense. How, how the deeper you go into it, you can feel the pieces of the puzzle snapping into place. It's not something so simple and crude as, hey, we gotta come up with something to keep the, keep the masses down. And when and and if someone approaches me with that, you know, hey, your religion is just a way to keep people down. Have you read Bhagavad Gita? Just seven hundred. Well, no. Have you read Bhagavatam? No. Have you have you read the Ramayana? No. Have you read the Have you read Ramanuja's commentary on the Bhagavad Gita? He's got a lot of important things to say. You know, he's a real strong philosopher. Have you read? No. Have you? You know, so it's like, unless you've done some serious research, how could one even come to that? Uh, so, uh, so I'm not, I'm not very moved by kind of uh, shallow arguments, which I generally find those kind of uh, presentations are. Um, not that I don't think that it's not something worth thinking about. I do think it's, I think it's totally worth thinking about. But when I engage with that question, I come up with the answer, no, I do not believe that that's what spirituality is all about. And then the, the next list of questions that he comes up with are kind of related to that, but they kind of focus on one point. I'll, I'll read them quickly and then I'll try to summarize them. One, if reality is a dream and we should learn to be indifferent to the physical world or put less emphasis in the physical world, how would a yogi reconcile the very real pain and from physical harm or worse from dangers or starvation from lack of physical goods? And then he lists some Buddhist, Buddhist ideas, which he says, they sound like they could lead to some very problematic behavior. For instance, all suffering comes from the wish for your own happiness. Perfect Buddhas are born from the, thoughts, from the thought to help others. Therefore, exchange your own happiness for the sufferings of others. Even if someone is out of a strong desire, steals all your wealth or has it stolen, dedicate your body, possessions, and all your virtue, past, present, and future. Even if someone tries to cut off your head when you haven't done the slightest thing wrong, out of compassion, take all his misdeeds upon yourself, et cetera. It goes on like this. And then he goes on to ask some other questions. For instance, how do you deal with family members that gaslight you, that purposely do harm through verbal, emotional, and psychological abuse at our expense for their own benefit, and they pretend to love us? Do you just accept that? You know, um, an extreme scenario, scenario the slaves on slave ships coming from Africa, what should they have done? Should they have just accepted it and said, this is the material world and this is karma and not done anything to become free? How does an enlightened person deal with real injustice from society that threatens our existence? Or finally, what is the thought of Malcolm X's militant response to fighting, to fighting people who wish to do us existential, ex existential harm? Many times there are people who you can't love or pray your way out. Okay. So I'm glad, I want to, I'm glad you got this question. <laughs> well, I want to summarize. I think the, there's a basic dichotomy going on here that, that's, that Adam is speaking of. On one hand, you know, the, the, the spiritual literature, particularly the spiritual literature of India, has a lot to say that this world is an illusion. Learn to become indifferent to it. Um, it's all passing by and has no true substance. Isolate yourself. Let it all go. Don't engage with it. So that's one idea. But then the other day, idea is, well, what about like real suffering that's going on? Are you just going to ignore it? Is that what we're supposed to do? You know? So, so what I, what, th it's a great series of questions. And I think it's something that I'm finding is coming up a lot. Like since we've begun this podcast, th there's a lot of questions that are dealing with that, this dichotomy of does a spiritual person become a recluse? And, and just allow what happens to happen and, and um, just kind of ignores the world because the world is an illusion. You know, sometimes Raghunath will be saying something about, hey, you know, you, there's, you just can't change certain things in life and we just have to accept it and so on. But then on the other side, 
there's this idea of being an activist. You know, there's the rec recluse, and then there's the activist. And then there's a long line between the two. Those would be what I'm saying. And what I believe that the spiritual tradition is saying is that both responses can be valid spiritual practices. On the one extreme, a total recluse, a to someone that just wanders off and lives in a cave. That can be a valid way of practicing spirituality. And then a full-on activist, someone who's every day deeply engaged in serving others and trying to improve the social conditions, that person can also be perfectly well situated in their spiritual practice. And we have to find our place where we fit in on that line in between, right? It may be more to one side, it may be more to the other, but if, we, if we're doing it with grasping the truth, the reality that's presented through these literatures, understanding the philosophy and not losing touch with it, then we can exist anywhere on that line. So the Bhagavad Gita, which is saying, you know, in, in, in the verse 216 of the Bhagavad Gita, it says, those who are seers of the truth have concluded that of the non-existence, there's no endurance, and of the eternal, there's no change. They have concluded this by studying the nature of both. So the idea that if something changes, it's not real, it's an illusion, you know? And in the 15th chapter, it speaks about how this world is like a reflection, how it's like there's a banyan tree that's upside down. And the commentators have said, it's, it's saying that the world that we live in is reflection. It's, it's not real. It's, it's something that is based on, on, on a realm that's beyond this, but it's kind of like a virtual reality. So the Bhagavad Gita is going to tell us that. It's going, to, it's going to give us a philosophical concept that in a sense, the very world that we're moving through in is unreal. But look at the context in which it's being said. It's being said in a context where Krishna is sharing that with Arjuna, but at the same time telling him, hey, I need you to get your head straight and deal with the social circumstance, the political circumstance that's going on right now, and I need you to fight in this battle. Right, so he on one hand he's given him this this kind of uh, ephemeral, otherworldly information about a reality that lies beyond, and that this world is illusion. And but he's saying engage in this world in an active way and do what needs to be done, you know. And he'll also th th there's in the in the fourth verse of the twelfth chapter of the Gita, Krishna uses two terms. He says, one is sarvatra samabhudhaya, to be equally disposed to every living being, right? Whether they're good or bad, whether they're doing harm to others or not. I, in one sense, I see them all equally. But then it also says sarva bhuta hite rataha, to be engaged in the welfare of all. So that one can kind of have both, can simultaneously have a concept of how this world is illusory, but also recognize the real suffering that's taking place in it and respond to it. And, and even in Bhagavatam, it's going to be said that great personalities almost always accept voluntary suffering because of the suffering of people in general. And this is considered to be the, the parma aradhanam, the highest method of worship of God, who is akila atmanaha, present in everyone's heart. So one can be a recluse, one could be an activist. You know, Each one has its potential uh, pros and cons. You know, you can be a recluse with a hardened heart that just doesn't care about the sufferings of the others. Mm -hmm. You could be an activist that's so caught up in your activism that you're losing touch with the spiritual truth of what lies beyond. But we have to find our place, to, we have to tune in. And that is generally done with the help of guru and, and, and people that we trust that, that understand things. We can tune in where exactly we're going to work on that line in between, where, where we resonate just right. And then we're going to serve in this world. And we're going to also recognize the illusion of this world at the same time and, and click into a practice that really is just right for us. That's, that's, that, that is, um, uh, how do I want to say, like uh, tailored just for us. And that's what gurus are meant to do. They're meant to help us find that dharma, that service that, that's just suited to our psychology, that's rooted in truth, and that's effective. And so, that's my answer to that question. I hope that's helpful. I think they're great questions. I think it's the kind of stuff we could talk about forever. forever. Yeah. <laughs> but hopefully that's helpful. Okay. Thank you, Adam, for those great questions. Okay, Rugg, are you ready for your question? Yes, sir. Okay. 
This is coming from Jesse. Um, I'm hoping you can answer a question for me, either here or on the show. Since the coronavirus crisis began, you have repeatedly talked about the toxicity of, media, of the media and news cycle. I agree, being totally consumed in it is an unhealthy thing. However, my day job is as a journalist at one of Australia's biggest newspapers. Okay. As such, I'm required by my job to absorb myself in it every day. This is related to the question that I just took in a, in a sense, isn't it? This is a big question you hear again and again. Yeah, there's still more to the question. Let me, let me just finish it. I try to take the Bhagavad Gita's advice by doing my worldly duty and not being attached to the results. But my question is this, is by its nature my work toxic to my spiritual advancement? I often want to take a less stressful career, but especially during this massive economic downturn, leaving a well-paying full-time job would be unwise. And at the same time, I see the work I'm the work of informing people on how to best navigate this crisis as something that is useful during this time. I guess the question is twofold. If I should continue this line of work, what are the best ways to cultivate detachment to the negative parts of it so that I can continue to advance in bhakti and spiritual life? Nice question, Jesse. You ready? Question, yeah. Um, the first thing that pops into my head is you got to be like a fireman. Can you, can you still say the word fireman? Is that a, is it fire, fire pers person? Fire personality. You gotta be like a fire personality. You gotta know when to go into that fire where you can save and get yourself out alive. You can't just go in uh, like in your, in a bikini and uh, ah, you know, you have to go like complete, you gotta wear the coat, you gotta wear the helmet, you gotta have the oxygen on. Then you get there, you save the lives and you get out. So if you can go into your career and, 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 and you have to put up a bubble. You have to put up like a, little, like a little snow globe around yourself where you can be in it, but not of it. Then it's okay. And of course, you're gonna get hit by it a little bit because you're dealing with all these people, but you need some protective space. And one way to protect yourself is a sadhana, is a morning sadhana where you're hearing the Bhagavatam, you're chanting japa, you have some time for meditation, focus and connection with nature. Then you go in. And, and you deal with all the craziness of the, of the news. But if you're just going in unprotected, be careful because then you become affected by their, so I was saying this last night on the Ramayan Leela yesterday, it's sort of like, we wanna become spiritually fixed and we wanna give our company to people who are struggling in the material world. I want to avoid the company and protect myself from bad association and I want to, take the company of people who, who I feel are really evolved. And that's how we should see it. We, should, we, 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 we have to realize who we're dealing with at all times. It's not arrogance, but it's understanding like, I have some parameters around me that I'm not gonna let everybody in. That's part of being a yogi is I'm very, very careful about what I'm letting in my ears, in my eyes, in my mouth, in my nose, with the company I keep. I have to, have, I have to know in stone what that is. And sometimes there's people who just like, it's over. I can't do that anymore. And the interesting thing is, as we start to progress in our spiritual practice, um, we're going to get to a point where we're going to be like, this doesn't fit my, who I am anymore. It doesn't make sense anymore. It doesn't word. I'm running, I'm running some application from 19, you know, 95. Uh, I need a new um, operating system to work. All right, I'll need a new career. This doesn't work for me anymore. I mean, it happens with people all the time. Um, I'll date anybody. And all of a sudden I said, no, I'm, I'm really concerned about animal rights. I'm really concerned about uh, veganism or vegetarianism. And then all of a sudden they realize I don't want to date anybody because if I really feel strongly about this value, I don't want to date a person who's not like that. So as we start to, do, start to chisel away at what I am and what I want to be in this world, it sort of creates less room for um, maybe a career or a partner or a place to live that's going to be really the antithesis of who I want to become. Um, that's the first thing that po pops into my m pops into my mind. Um, I, I think I was to say I think that's a lot of great information. Uh, please continue if you were going. I don't know if you're. I'm, I'm just rereading what he said now, but uh, yeah. I think you don't have to, you don't have to throw it out. You just got to protect yourself from it. 
And I think his, I think what you're saying is, is really important that we may come to a conclusion that this job is just not conducive for my spiritual life in some cases, but it doesn't sound like, like, uh, just like, uh, it was Jesse that wrote that, right? That, yeah. that that's Jesse's case as being a journalist, you know, um, it's certain jobs and certain association will be really toxic, but you know, it, it's not like we have to necessarily isolate ourselves, but we can kind of, ins- like you're saying, kind of insulate ourselves. That's a, that's a great hashtag. Isolate, yeah. don't isolate, insulate. Yeah. That, that we go into that that's world. A, that's a ta- If anybody's looking for a new tattoo out there, that might be one for you. You talk to our friend Scott Bagos, you'll put that right across your chest. Insulate, <laughs> don't isolate. <laughs> Very good. That way we can work in this world, but not be, but, but re- remain, uh, it's just like our mask or our whatever, you know, we're, we're going out there into the world, but we're not getting, getting uh, run over by it. But if you're doing work to help people understand how to respond to this well, then I mean, that's, that's great work to do. It's important work. Yeah. To do. You should feel like you're contributing to something worthy or else mm-hmm. that'll also after a while I'll start to realize why am I doing this? Right. So that's great. I hope that was useful, Jesse. That was, thank you. It was useful for me. Um, now from PJ from Stockholm. Do you know who PJ is, Robin? PJ from Stockholm. I don't know. Okay. We have a lot of Swedes. There's, a, there's something about Sweden. Sweden. Got a lot of Finland. Swedes that are, yeah. Danish. I've been going to Sweden a lot Germany. for years. Um, okay. I have a question about how to relate to other religious traditions in the multi-faith societies most of us live in. I've explored and tried out various spiritual traditions over the last 15 years and have recently returned to the Catholic tradition of my youth. I do not find a lot of inspiration. I, I do find a lot of inspiration in yoga and the bhakti tradition. And there's quite a lot in the concepts and ideas you talk about that I recognize from mystical traditions like Sufism, Kabbalah, Buddhism, and Christian mysticism. I'd be interested to hear how you guys look upon your own choice of the bhakti path in relation to other traditions. Is it a qualitative difference or is it mostly aesthetical? Do you somehow feel the Vedic tradition is inherently better or superior to other traditions? Why exactly do you, do you think you are bhakti yogis and not, let's say cool Catholics or so coincidence or not? PJ. Okay. That's, that's, I like to consider myself a cool Catholic, actually. (laughs) I'm trying to be a cool Catholic. (laughs) Um, I, uh, it's a nice question. And, and certainly there are, um, when one looks at these different traditions and he went down a, a, a list of them, Catholicism, Sufism, Kabbalah, Buddhism, Christian mysticism. Um, yeah, there's a, there's a thread that's certainly running through them. If someone's sensitive, you know, the great uh, speakers or teachers in our tradition have, have pointed out that if someone's really connected with their own spiritual tradition, they should be able to see the essence of their own tradition in other traditions, right? Mm. Then, and then you feel it. So then like a bhakti yogi, you know, like from say the, or what you could call the Hindu tradition or the Vaishnava tradition, um, is going to meet a, a, a Catholic who's um, practicing this in one sense, practicing the same thing in a, in, in, a, in different in a different tradition, right? But I can feel it. I can feel that that what I've understood, you've understood, right? Because we're now, if you, you could take two people from those same traditions that are only on the surface, that haven't penetrated very deeply to the essence. And they're going to say, your thing is very different and it's wrong. Mm. But you take two people, even maybe those same people that have gone deeper into it, you know, at, at, at a further point in their progress. And they're going to say, no, it's very similar. We're actually, it's the same thing we're connected with. So the deeper you go into your spiritual tradition, the more you should be able to recognize that essence in other traditions. Okay, that's the first thing. So then the question becomes, well, then why did you, why are you guys into bhakti yoga or why are you into Vaishnavism would actually be kind of like the, the real way. Why are you Krishna devotees? Right. And so then now then I'm g- going to give you my personal answer. And my personal answer would have a lot to do with how I answered the, 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 the question earlier is that I've, in my own studies, I find the depth that's presented here, the theological depth, the philosophical depth, my personal experience, it answered my questions 
in ways that I never, and I'll be honest, it's not that I studied other traditions in great depth. I grew up Catholic. I can't say that I studied it in great depth. Um, but I certainly had a lot of exposure to people from that tradition, and, uh, priests and nuns and, and my parents and so on. Uh, I, 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 so I was raised Catholic. I've learned to appreciate Catholicism more as a bhakti yogi. It, it opened it up to me. The way that, that it answered my questions helped me look at Catholicism and really more than ever appreciate, particularly the New Testament and Jesus' teachings there. Um, but I've, I would say on one hand, philosophically, theologically, it, the depth of the tradition impressed me so much that I, I felt called to, to follow it. And then, you know, so that may be the qualitative difference that he's speaking about. And on the aesthetical, I fell in love with the culture, you know. I fell in love with the holy places. I fell in love with the, the, the holy people. I fell in love with the, um, the, the, the arts of the bhakti tradition. I fell in, you know, I just fell in love with it all. So my heart's called to it. So on a personal level, there's that as well. There is the aesthetic end of it that, that really appeals to me as well as the, I would say, philosophical and theological presentation that spoke to me in a way that I I was moved by. And I, I, I want to be careful when I say this, but I do feel like it goes farther than any other tradition, that the other traditions are aligned with it. But in, in my, my faith is that it will go farther to, to the point where you get the most explicit detailed, sophisticated, uh, satisfying descriptions of who God is, you know, and how God operates and, and, and um, the, 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 the science of Rasa, how God loves. And, and so it, to me, I found more there than I could, than that, than I would expect to find anywhere else, but I don't want to impose that on some, someone else may find it in other ways. Yourself, like Rago, you want to share a little bit about that? Just a, I like how in the Vedic tradition, it gives you, it teaches about a regular spiritual practice, a daily spiritual practice. It emphasizes a sadhana, a regular spiritual practice, and that spiritual, pra and, you know, it's not like, I'm sure the other traditions it's, may have it there, but you re it's, really, it's really promoted, a sadhana is really promoted, a regular spiritual practice, which I found I've really needed at a certain point in my life, I like, I want to know what to do every day for my spiritual life. Like, how do I improve it every day? And I think it's important to, to keep it at the forefront of our, to not make it a thing that we do once a week for a couple hours, but my spiritual life is a regular thing. It's, it, it, it's my spiritual life is my life and material things that'll happen. They're not just happening in the periphery, but my spiritual life is my real life. And, and you, and I agree with you. Yeah. The culture is, uh, it's just charming. It's just a charming culture. How could you live without Bunky Bihari and How could I live Abbas? without Bihari Lal and uh, <laughs> the Vaishnavas? And, uh, and, uh. Okay. Okay, you ready for the next question, Raghu? We may have yeah. time for one or two more. You, this is actually two questions, both okay. on the question of teachers slash gurus. Sure. One comes from Bhakta Ed. If one takes diksha or initiation into the lineage from one guru without... The within the tradition, and that person turns out to be a bad choice for legit reasons, whatever they may be. Can the disciple seek shelter of another guru? And then I'll just throw in the next question too. Uh, what, and this is from Devin, what if I can't find a legitimate teacher close by? I live in Columbia, Missouri. If you happen to know anyone close by. <laughs> Columbia, Missouri? I didn't even know Columbia, Missouri existed. I don't even know where Missouri is. <laughs> so, uh, so one question was, if you choose a guru and it somehow you, you come to the idea that Great this question. was a bad choice, can you seek shelter elsewhere? Can you seek another guru? Let's you know, that first. It happens sometimes uh, that people, they get attracted at a certain phase in their life to a guru or a teacher. And they think, yeah, I want to get very serious about this tradition. And I want to make a commitment to this teacher as my this is my teacher. It's almost like a marriage. Um, but our real, our real relationship is with Krishna ultimately. And this person is speaking to you. And it's very common to see how people speak 
to you at certain phases of your life. But we're always, we're still growing as people. And another person might step into your life at a different phase of your life and speak louder or speak more affectionate or speak in a way that it makes more sense when you're 32 instead of 22 or 42 as opposed to 22. So it's completely, um, traditionally speaking, it's understandable and okay what you're saying is that we have a diksha, one who, a diksha guru, one who first gives us the mantra. And especially in our lineage, we see that the diksha guru is not so emphasized. The, the shiksha guru or the one who plays this paramount um, uh, sort of uh, lighthouse in your life on a regular basis, this beacon of light that's coming to you and speaking to you on a regular basis, they are, um, they are the they are the person that's going to be the, the most directive as you move in this world. And it's, it's careful not to, um, if, especially if the guru that you first got attracted to is in good standing, it just, it's just not a good fit for you. Then you always hold a high type of respect for that person because the tendency is, here's the material tendency is uh, I, I can't, jive with this person anymore. I don't see things the way they see, the way they speak. It doesn't resonate with me. It resonated when I was really new to this. So I'm going to make up a good reason why they are immature and why I'm so much more mature than them. We do anything to protect our ego. But it's nice just to say this person has been incredibly empowered and sent to me. Um, but, um, for my spiritual life now, this person also speaks to me. So it's always careful not to make offenses, even if you're taking shelter of another, another, uh, teacher. And sometimes you might even want to approach that teacher and say, you know, I'm, I'm finding myself more attractive. I appreciate everything you've done for me. Um, but I, I find myself more, um, connected with this other teacher and a good guru would say full blessings. A, a guru is not attached to the disciple. But the, the student is attached to the teacher. So a good, a good guru shouldn't try, is not you know, trying to gather up disciples around. Um, they're, 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 they're here to help. And by the way, you are acting as gurus, I'm sure, for people in your life too. People will come to you. Oh, I need the, what do you think about this? It seems like you've studied Vedic tradition. What do you think? They're going to come to you. But at the same time, we're not dependent on them. We, we're concerned about them. We're caring about them but we're not dependent on them to make me feel whole. So a guru, if you say, I, I'm more attracted to this guru, at that point, you, the, the guru will be, oh, that's fine. They're just here. The guru is just here to serve their guru. They're not here to gather disciples. So we don't want to make offenses, and, but it's completely understandable. Okay, and then the As next question. A legitimate teacher close by, I don't know anybody, Devin. It's a good question. Um, but what if you can't, then what do you do? So what if you can, you know what, there's relationships you can have. This is the glories of the information age is you can have teachers in your life on a regular basis, just through YouTube. I mean, that just speak to you and that, that infuse your life with the wisdom on a regular basis. And their idea of the, the um, Vani and the Vapu or the, it's not that you're with the guru at, at, at all times that does the best service to the guru. If we look at someone like Radhana Swami, who's done so much incredible service, he hasn't spent that much time with his guru, but he's imbibed the instructions of his guru. He's imbibed it. He's really taken it to heart. He's put it to practice and he's serving the guru. And when we serve guru, in one sense, you are serving the guru, but you're serving a lineage of gurus. Um, we, you want the blessings of the whole Guru Varga or the whole Guru clan. And they, the Guru clan is what's bringing you back to the spiritual world. It's not necessarily one person in particular. So um, uh, here, all of us here are showing up for the Bhagavatam and we are serving, we're serving ourselves by, ser by, 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 by hearing the Bhagavatam on a regular basis. And, but we're also it's training us to go into the world and serve other people. And at the same time, we're getting the blessings from not just our guru, but our gurus, 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 the whole lineage of gurus. And that's a important, it's an important thing to understand that guru is, guru is one, 
especially if they're teaching the appropriate thing. Guru is one. That's why, that's why in the Bhagavatam class, we're training ourselves to develop that discernment of what is guru or else what will happen is we'll get lost. Um, so that's also important. What is a real guru? Um, who's qualified to have that title? Um, what are these gurus teaching? These are big questions. I think we should talk about it a lot this week. Yeah, I, I was just thinking it's such a big, we got to spend always more, some more time on that subject. When everybody, th- that was fun. I like question day. Me too. Keep Hope the questions helpful. coming. At wisdom of the sages, one away to gmail.com. It's our time. It's our time. Thanks everybody for joining us. We had a hundred and something people on, uh, on uh, Zoom today, it was beautiful. And it's so good to see this international crew dealing with the coronavirus and not just surviving, just thriving, getting deeper into their spiritual life, deeper connected, trying to educate themselves in so many ways and take care of their body and take care of their consciousness. And look at this as a time that we can actually quit the hustle and just sort of like, okay, universe is telling us just to you know, go deeper and um, be connected with the people that you love. What a great, what a, what a great opportunity. And at the same time, we're praying for the people that are going through some pain and some struggle and our hearts go out to them as well. And it's a, it's a great chance to really be philosophical in times like this. So thanks for everybody for joining us. Thanks again to everybody on Patreon who's really helping us do this. It means a lot to us. Patreon.com slash wisdom of the sages. And uh, again, keep those questions coming for next week. It's a great day for a great day. That's what I'm saying today. It's a great day for a great day. That's my tattoo. We say take that namaste, split it apart, bring it back together, turn it into a hand clap. Let's see who joined late today. Today is Friday. So tomorrow night, Patreon members, I'll give a sweet baby Krishna class. New format. Yes, Tristram and the babies, they're dancing. Get that baby to dance. Good to see you, Devaki. Mara G. I didn't see you before, Mara. Okay, this is our, oh, NASA's here from Dublin, Ireland in her house, Bashar Mash. Ready? Krishna Karaoke. I really gotta learn the words for this. Tom York. Bye.